we've got these two schemes in frontline CLL um, where you have continuously dosed covalent BTK inhibitors with ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib. And then you have um, obinutuzumab and venetoclax for fixed duration. I know that in Europe, the EMA, I believe, has approved an ibrutinib venetoclax combination, which is also fixed duration. And I believe Health Canada did as well, but the US FDA has not at this time. So I'm in the States, so I have to mention that. Um, but uh, I think uh, there's multiple factors that go into that. And I like to break it down based on three different kind of categories of factor. And I'm going to limit this to first-line therapy discussion, um, because obviously, if you've been treated with one or the other, that impacts subsequent therapy selection. Um, one of them is disease features. So we know that with uh, continuously dosed BTK inhibitors in the frontline setting, um, deletion 17P CLL patients and non-deletion 17P um, CLL patients have uh, you know the same progression-free survival. So I think to maximize the disease control from a first-line therapy for patients with deletion 17P, the continuously dosed BTK inhibitor has an advantage over a fixed duration scheme. And we don't really know for sure yet with the venetoclax, ibrutinib, how the deletion 17P patients do. Um, there's some suggestion it might be a little better than the venetoclax open, where those patients have a shorter progression-free survival than those without that feature. Um, but there is some suggestion in the day that maybe it's not identical to those without 17P. So I think the disease feature is, and you know, kind of um, IGHB and mutated uh, uh, patients also, you know, and, and mutated is the same with continuous BTK inhibitor versus, you know, the fixed duration regimens. So selecting based on disease these features is always something that we think about as physicians and hematologists. I do think, though, that patient disease or patient non-CLL factors matter. Um, BTK inhibitors, even the second generation ones that have lower risk of this still have a risk of um, hypertension and atrial arrhythmias, which matters uh, deeply for some patients, but not all. So if you have someone that's had ablations for AFib or is on multiple antihypertensives, that scheme really doesn't necessarily seem like the best fit for them. Venetoclax avoids that. Similarly, venetoclax, of course, um, in people with impaired renal fit, uh, renal function, like severely impaired or at least moderately with a high disease burden, or who um, can't tolerate the IV fluids or oral fluids um, to safely start it for tumor lysis risk mitigation, really shouldn't be getting venetoclax. So I think there's some patient like comorbidity features that help you select. And then lastly, this can be a deeply personal preference for some patients. I'm here in central Ohio, um, where I work um, at the Ohio State University, uh, which is in Columbus, Ohio. We have patients that travel from rural areas multiple hours to get care here. And so the tumor lysis mitigation and infusion scheme needed for venetoclax and obinutuzumab is not something that's practical for all of my patients. Uh, those that live in Columbus, it's easy, um, but those living hours away, it's hard. Um, so the continuously dosed BTK inhibitors have an advantage for those patients because you can just start taking the pills do really well. I find that older people already taking pills are very um, comfortable with that scheme. Um, and then, of course, the fixed duration has the very large advantage of completing treatment and being off treatment. And not 100%, <laughs> but the vast majority of patients um, prefer to live their lives without having to take CLL treatment every day. So I think, you know, like the patient features are kind of like or, um, patient preferences. Um, and so I actually consider all three of those things when trying to decide between um, a continuous BTK inhibitor versus a fixed duration venetoclax and OBIN or theoretically venetoclax BTK inhibitor um, therapy. And of course, my preference is usually to enroll people on clinical trials, but that's a different discussion.